sa iyong damdamin ipamalas ang tanging galing tumayong buong tapang harapin ang buhay akapin ang tagumpay tulungan ang kapwa at bigyang halaga huwag hatakin ng pababa isipin huwag sana ang sarili lang pakisamat Bayanihan Subukan natin Isulong at Likawan ang Magandang bukas Ikaw at ako Magkasama tayo Sa lubungin ng Kinabukasan In the last 500 years, Filipinos have fought for freedom, unity, and equality. We have made our mark in many fields, from science and medicine to culture and the arts. We are beacons of creativity, resourcefulness, resiliency, and compassion. In 2021, the Filipino people will join the world in commemorating one of the greatest achievements of mankind. The first circumnavigation of the world. We celebrate this historic achievement by bannering an important message. Over adversity and struggles, we shall triumph. Putting humanity first. Always.
pagpalaya at makasisayang 2021 sa ating lahat. I'm Juvelin Nervez, history researcher from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and a member of the National Queen Centennial Secretariat. Welcome again to the Countdown to 500 Online Lectures, a special program brought to you by the Office of the President of the Philippines and the National Queen Centennial Committee in anticipation of the 2021 Queen Centennial Commemorations in the Philippines. This is a series of online lectures which aims to sustain the Filipinos' interest to the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan, the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world, and other related events in 2021 and this time of COVID-19 pandemic. Maraming salamat po sa lahat na patuloy na sumusubaybay sa aming mga programa. Gayun din sa mga katuwang na ahensya na kaagapay namin upang may sakatupara ng programang ito, ang National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Presidential Communications Operations Office, Radio at Television Malacanang, Department of Foreign Affairs, and Department of Education. We are live via Facebook pages of the National Consential Committee, NHGP, PCOO, RTVM, NCCA, PFA, and DepEd. Please don't forget to share this live stream to your friends and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash NQC2021. Follow at NQC2021 on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel, National Quincentennial Committee for more educational materials. Follow also our playlist on Spotify, the 500 Years Philippines, to access the official soundtrack of the Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines. Kasama ko ngayon ang partner moderator ko na si Mr. Jer Cruz. Hello, Jerwin. Salamat, Jerwin. Magandang umaga po sa lahat. Muli, ako si Jerwin Cruz, Historic Sites Development Officer 2 ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines at kasapi ng NQC Secretariat. Ilan lamang kong paalala. Maaari niyo pong gamitin ang Quincentennial Online Lecture Portal sa panonood ng lecture na ito. Mapapanood niyo rin sa nasabing portal ang previous lectures ng NQC at iba pang partner institutions natin. Maaari rin po kayong makagenerate ng e-certificate sa nasabing portal. Ang kailangan niyo lamang pong gawin ay mag-sign up sa portal.nqc.gov.ph at tumutok sa live stream ng lecture. Ang ating pong lecture ngayon ay kalabing anim na na countdown to 500 online lecture. Balikan po natin ang kalabing limang lektura noong January 22 kung saan tinalakay ni Dr. Francis Chas Navarro ang nuances ng mga Spanish archival documents at ibinahagi ang mga pamamaraan kung paano mas mapapahusay ang pagbabasa at pagsasalin ng mga nilalaman ng mga dokumentong ito upang magamit ng mas nakakaraming Pilipino. Interesting po ang paksa ng ating tagapagsalita ngayon sa pagkatatalakay ng ating guest speaker ang mahalagang papel at koneksyon ng pagkain sa kasaysayan ng circumnavigation at sa labanan sa Mactan. Kung sakali po na habang nagpe-present ang ating speaker ay meron kayong mga katanungan, feel free to ask question through the comment section of, the, of this live stream and we will accommodate them at the latter part of the lecture. At upang ipakilala ang ating tagapagsalita, narito po muli si... Maraming salamat, Jerwil. Uh, our speaker for today's lecture has been a Philippine cultural worker and internationally awarded nonfiction author for over five decades. In addition to having served pro bono on government commissions such as the National uh, Commission for Culture and the Arts, Philippine Centennial Commission and UNESCO National Commission of the Philippines at different periods from 1992 to 2011, she continues to serve as a National Museum Trustee, a member of the Board of Advisors for Ayala Museum, and a consultant for cultural projects. She pioneers historical research of Philippine food with a focus from 1515 to 1946, covering the Spanish and American colonial eras. Among her internationally awarded uh, food books are the Governor General's Kitchen, Philippine Culinary Vignes, uh, Vignes and Recipes from 1521 to 1935, and the foods of Rizal. Her forthcoming title this year is When Mangoes and Olives Met, 
any uh, historical handling of colonial events from 1515 to 1946 in the Philippines. And on uh, April 13, 2021, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines will officially launch her book entitled Figa Feta's Philippine Picnic about food encounters during the Magellan and Cano expedition from 1519 to 1522. Guys, let's welcome our speaker for today, Miss Feliz Prudente Santa Maria. <laughs> Good morning! Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. So this morning, we're going to be looking into Philippine food history. Let's see, where are my slides? <laughs> I don't see my slides yet. Uh, ngayong umaga, ang pamagat ng ating presentasyon ay The Happy Tummy. Kasi importante nga na busog po tayo. No? Let's see if we can get to our slides. And I'm hoping that with today's um, talk, and we're going to make it kind of light, no? We try to make it a little light because the Battle of Mactan is a very serious um, event in our history. No? Pero we'll try to lighten it a little bit, which is why um, our topic is called the Happy Tummy. Alam po ninyo, ngayon lang medyo nagkakaroon ng interes sa Philippine culinary history or food history. At ito po ay hindi lang tungkol sa kung paano kunyari nagsimula ang pansit, kung saan siya nagsimula, at kailan, hindi lang naman po yan tungkol sa mga halo-halo, kailan nagsimula ang halo-halo. Hindi po. Ang food history may kalaliman din kung uh, paano tayo nagkakaroon ng mga pagkain na bagay sa ating health. No? And as health studies over the world um, change, so will the recommended food. So yeah, there we are po. No? The happy tummy, tapos ako yan. Okay. So we're going to be looking into Philippine food history today. Let's switch the slide. Okay, next one. And we're going to go back 500 years. Yeah, 500 years po tayo. At yung tatlo na yan, yung goodwill, tolerance, and deception, ay nako po. Kasama po yan sa kwento. Now, even if the events occurred long ago, they tell you a food story that everyone, next slide, this is about a food story that um, anyone, anywhere in the world, so hindi lang Filipino, will be able to understand this food story. The world will understand. Next. We want to have food on the table. And we do not want anybody to go hungry. So when we are busog, diba, our tummy is happy. It is eaten well. We also want to avoid bultak. We want to avoid uh, the, to, to suffer the discomforts from overeating. Now, next slide. In the early 20th century, someone who went around with a protruding belly was considered well off because that person could afford food. Diba? Sometimes we would say about a man, ako, yung lalaki na yan, ang buntis. Actually, what we mean is that man is going around with a very big tummy because he's overeaten. But today we know that being overweight is unhealthy. So we have to remember that. Being overweight is unhealthy. Now, our story has three parts. And we're going to begin with part one that shows a good Filipino trait. Kasi po yung ating kasaysayan, kasama po na dyan yung our good Filipino attitudes, behavior, and values. All of that is connected with food. So, dito sa Filipino, di ba, we want to feed those in need. Next. Next slide. Our story is set in the Visayas, in central Philippines. And 
On March 16th, there were nine men from the island of Suluan, and they saw these three large ships near Homanhon Island. Uh, a big flagship on which rode Ferdinand Magellan, you see him there. Well, Ferdinand Magellan was about 39 or 40 years old, and he was the chief captain of the Armada. And the Armada was actually on its way to the Spice Islands in Indonesia. Dumaan lang po sila sa atin. They are actually supposed to go south uh, east of the Philippines, no? Go down to Mindanao and then head for Indonesia. There were two other boats. One was the Conception, Conception, and the one you see on the screen, that was the smallest. It was called Victoria. And Magellan named it uh, to honor Our Lady of Victoria, Mama Mary as Our Lady of Victory, uh, which was uh, the patron of a church in Seville, which was frequented by Magellan. Next slide. So Magellan, as you can see, uh, Magellan had found the long sought after strait to connect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. When he was in the, supposedly, uh, supposedly Dao, when he was in the palace of the Portuguese king, meron siya nakitang mapa na parang meron talagang tubig. Uh, there was like a strait or a river or a body of water connecting the Pacific the Atlantic Ocean, which was being, um, uh, being, um, uh, uh, where, where, where Spanish and Portuguese sailors, they were looking into the coastline of South, Central and South America, but nobody had actually found that dugtung, the connection between the Atlantic Ocean and what they knew to be waters on the side of Asia. So Magellan and his crew, these foreigners, they were the first Europeans to see the Pacific Ocean, to name it, and to sail across it. The only problem was they had no idea how vast, how big the Pacific Ocean was. Ang alam lang nila was the Atlantic Ocean, which is much, much narrower than the Pacific Ocean. So when they left Spain, they had loaded enough food to last for two years. Dalawang taon pa yan. So it was March 1521. Dapat meron pa silang food for five more months. Pero that was not the case. When they were crossing the Pacific Ocean, they actually starved. All their provisions had deteriorated and they were reduced to catching rats, the gut that were on board, and they would eat them. They even ate the powder of the wood. Yung, uh, the kahoy of the boat was becoming powder. It was rotting. And they were eating that. It, it was really very terrible. There were 21 persons on board who died of scurvy. And, and scurvy is caused by, uh, they didn't know this then, but scurvy is caused by the lack of vitamin C. What happens is the gums, they start to bleed and they won't stop bleeding. And eventually, all the, the, you get wounds on your body and they also will not stop. So one bleeds to death from scurvy. Next. Next slide. Now the nine men from Suluan Island, they must have been very curious about those three ships. Diba tayo mga Pilipino, mga usisero talaga. No? So they probably figured, uh, I wonder if these foreigners are friendly. Kung tatlong malalaking boat yan, outnumbered tayong nine men. But they decided to take the risk and they approached the men from Sinuan. They approached Magellan who happened to be on the beach at the time. There were sick members of his crew. They had built a tent, no? So that uh, his men could rest there and recover. And Magellan was paying 
personal attention to them. Now, since the islanders, siguro they were smiling, you know, uh, waving, trying to show that they were friendly. And Magellan said, well, since these men seem to be reasonable, he invited them for a meal to join them, to join the Spanish uh, at a meal on the beach, on a picnic. Because no? isipin natin, hindi sila nagkakaintindihan. Ha? So anyway, they were eating. And I suspect the Suluans, uh, like many of the Filipinos who are great sailors, they probably took one look at Magellan and his men and realized that these people had starved. They had starved. And um, they were suffering still from hunger. And so probably out of the kindness, out of the kindness, no, the Suluans decided to share some of the food that they were carrying. So the first gifts of the Filipinos to the uh, Spanish that consisted of one jar of wine that we think was coconut wine, two coconuts, some bananas, uh, different kinds, one of which was nine inches long, and the fish. Those were the first gifts of Filipinos to the visiting Spaniards. Next. Now, throughout the archipelago, where Magellan's crew sailed from March until October 1521, the foreigners found that the natives, that the islanders, they were friendly and they were offering, so you see those foods there, they were offering gifts of food and then they were bartering. You know, the natives were saying, the islanders were saying, here, you can barter for this food. And in fairness, Magellan had uh, things to barter with. So um, he, they were offering to share food. The foreigners were offering to share food. Now from Homanhon, the crew sailed to Limasawa, where they met Raja Colombo and his brother Raja South, uh, Siawi. And they celebrated uh, Easter Mass on Limasawa, which is considered the first Mass to have been celebrated in the Philippines, or that we know of. And then they decided to head for Cebu. That was because Cebu was a well-known trading port and it was at Cebu where the Spanish could get food, where they could get provisions. Now, Magellan had been in India, Malaysia, and Indonesia for about maybe eight years or more before he embarked on this uh, mission of discovery. So he would have been familiar with the foods of insular Southeast Asia, foods like those of the Philippines, and the foods of uh, the Spice Islands. There was another person on board who would have been familiar, and that was the slave of Magellan. The slave was Malay, and uh, Magellan gave him a Christian name and called him Enrique. So Enrique learned Spanish, and Enrique knew a Malay language. What we don't know exactly where he was from. Some people think maybe he was Filipino, but a lot of us don't think so. He was Malay, however, and Malay was, the interna was an international language of trade in the Southeast Asian area. Now, there was another fellow on sailing on the boat of Magellan and Enrique, and his name was Antonio Pigafetta. All we know is that Antonio Pigafetta was learned, and he um, was the neighbor and friend, and actually uh, a relation in a way, um, to a man from his neighborhood who was an ambassador of the Pope. And so here was a young Antonio Pigafetta. 
he was about 28 years old. I'm sure some of you there are even younger than 28, and maybe some of the teachers here are in their 20s. And so this is an age where you, you kind of want to see the world, you want to have an adventure. So maybe that's what Pigafetta wanted to do. We are not sure, but Pigafetta was on board. We don't know how he looked for many, many years. When I was a student, we thought Pigafetta looked like that picture there at the bottom. But we found out later, that's not Pigafetta. They chose a, they chose a statue, Pigafetta, uh, Pigafetta's descendant, who was born two years after Pigafetta died and said, well, maybe Pigafetta looked like that. But anyway, we don't know why he went. He went, but he did go on the voyage of discovery. Now, Pigafetta published his story of the voyage. It is titled, First Voyage Around the World. That's how important the circumnavigation was. It was the first voyage that went around the world. And Pigafetta is the first ever to write about Philippine food. There are three menus you see, and that's all he told us. He didn't tell us uh, much about the names of the dishes. He didn't tell us what were the ingredients of the pork with the broth or the roasted fish. He didn't give the native names for these dishes, but it's important. We know that in 1521, we were cooking. We were cooking those things. So Pigafetta's first voyage around the world, his book is uh, the earliest reference when studying Philippine food history. Food really helps, Isn't it? even up to now. We, we feed people that we, we want to, to, we want to agree, have an agreement with, we, we feed them. And food, up to now, it establishes goodwill, trust, and even friendship. So, as you could see, the Filipinos were very kind, considerate, hospitable to the foreigners in those three boats. That's what we learned from the first part. Filipinos want to make sure people do not go hungry. Very good trick. Let's never lose it. But now we get to the second part of our food story. And this is the uh, controversial part. How many of you have, uh, this, this is a kinaray uh, um, proverb, but I'm sure you've heard similar proverbs such as the person who bites the hand of someone who feeds him. Usually they say the dog or the animal, it bites the hand of the person feeding. So this is um, our second part. Just remember that saying. And this is the controversial part of Magellan's visit to the Philippines. All had been going very well. Uh, as the Magellan crew sailed to Cebu, in fact, guided personally by Raja Colombo so that they would not get lost. Look at the foods they ate. Now, you have to understand, Magellan had no map to guide him. They were in uncharted waters. He was in an area unknown and had never been visited by the Europeans and certainly not the Spanish. It was vital that the three ships load up on food. They were in Cebu because they needed food. They also had no guide. They didn't know how to get from Cebu to the Spice Islands. They showed samples of the different kinds of spices that they were looking for, ginger, clove, for instance, nutmeg. They had showed these spices to the Suluans and they knew what they were. They had showed these spices to Raja Colombo and he also knew 
what they were. But the Spanish had no idea how long the sail would be from Cebu to the Malucas, to the places where all these valuable spices were, to the destination that the Spanish king had ordered them to discover. So they were worried that they might end up again, like when they crossed the Pacific, they were worried that they might again uh, not have places where they could reload fresh food. And they probably wanted a guide so that they would not get lost. We, we need to understand that probably from our local, uh, our local provisions, they probably would have done well to load up on coconuts and on unripe bananas, maybe uncooked rice. They would carry that with them and to slaughter on board live chickens and pigs. The problem, however, arose as soon as they arrived in Cebu, as you can see on the screen. Raja Humabon, I mean, uh, being the head of a trading port, he expected the Armada to pay him tribute. But Magellan could not. He represented the most powerful sovereign in the world. I don't think King Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain, would have wanted Magellan to pay tribute to anybody. Now, an interpreter uh, for a Thai trader in port, there was a Thai trading boat, you know, probably selling porcelain and food products. And that trade, that interpreter said to Raja Humabon, he said, you know, I think these foreigners are like the ones who conquered India. That's why they have a trading post now in Goa. I think they are the same foreigners who conquered um, Malacca. That's near today's Singapore. He said, these, these people, these people are really vicious and they have, the, uh, they have the superior arms. We don't have arms like that. And so you better be careful. And then uh, Enrique, the Mal Malay-speaking slave of Magellan, said, you know, the king we represent is even more powerful than that Portuguese king you're talking about. That Portuguese king, yes, he, he is in charge of those areas now of part of India, part of um, this, uh, the, Malays, the Malay Peninsula. But our king is really king. He is the Holy Roman Emperor. He has a bigger... He has a bigger empire than the Portuguese. Our king is more superior. So you really have to be careful about Magellan and our king. Well, Raja Humamon told Enrique and Enrique's boss, who, happened to, who was with him during these negotiations, his name was Cristobal Rabelio, he told Enrique and Cristobal Rabello that Humabon would consult with his chiefs and um, see what they would, you know, see what they would say. But meanwhile, he said, Roger Humabon says, come on, meanwhile, just eat. And the foreigners were served an all-meat meal. An all-meat menu was reserved for Special guests, special occasions, definitely important guests. Now, Homabon came from a society that used food to help people deal with disagreement, you know, to, to keep people calm and peaceful during stressful times. One wonders if Raja Colombo 
have told Humabon about the foreigners' helmets and clothing that were impervious to, to the bolo, to the blades. Or if Raja Colombo had told Humabon about the powerful cannons. In fact, when it's crazy, when Magellan was entering the Cebu port, he was firing cannons. He said that it wasn't to scare them. It was so that the islanders would be honored by their presence. But I'm sure deep down inside him, he said, well, let me scare them with these cannons. So we don't really know all the hidden details about all these backroom dialogues and discussions. But whatever the hidden details, a compromise was reached. There would be a native blood compact between Humabon and Magellan, after which they would exchange gifts. Kulambo kept assuring Magellan, meanwhile, that the Cebuanos were collecting food for him. Even Magellan used food in negotiations and to celebrate agreements. He gave Humabon a silk robe made in the Turkish fashion. He gave gilded drinking cups that were known to be highly prized in the area. Pigafetta may have been the first, not Magellan, Pigafetta may have been the first to actually see Raja Humabon because Raja Humabon kept sending his men. But finally, Raja Humabon uh, allowed Magellan to send uh, to send two representatives down to uh, his palace. And Pigafetta saw that the Raja was drinking very likely palm wine and his uh, sumsuman was turtle eggs. So the Raja invited Pigafetta. He said, why don't you have a meal with me? And Pigafetta said, no, I'm sorry, I can't. And then Ruhamabu was explaining uh, that he was going to have golden jewelry like the ones he made, he was wearing. He was going to give golden jewelry to the Spanish king as a gift. Now on Magellan's seventh day, to start counting, okay? So Magellan's been in Cebu on the seventh day, Raja Humabon, his family, the chiefs and followers, they were baptized. Humabon's wife was given a statue of Christ as a little child. And some say that that statue uh, was actually Pigafetas. But we don't know. We don't know for sure. And it is the image found at the Cebu Cathedral today. Although Magellan was not ordered to convert any pagans, a mass baptism occurred. And so I'm sure all of us wonder how much Christian doctrine did Humabon understand? They couldn't even speak the same language. You know, you, you just really wonder. But still, uh, you say, well, okay, even if Humabon maybe didn't understand what was going on, he was baptized. So next slide. Well, Magellan must have been very proud to have planted a cross signifying that Cebu was committed to Roman Catholicism, which was Spain's religion. Now, you have to remember that Spain was a one religion empire. If you were Spanish, you had to be Roman Catholic. So now that Humabon was Christian, he could really become a Spanish ally officially. Now there you see a painting of the Spanish King Charles V, but this was five years after the circumnavigation crew returned. Magellan, meanwhile, had made Humabon part of the Spanish empire. And if you can read that, no? So, the important thing was for Magellan to get back, right? To tell King Charles, you know, I've got this ally here named Humabon with all his chiefs. So the important thing was now Humabon had become part of the Spanish Empire 
and subject to the laws of the Spanish king. That was the turning point. See, Magellan, instead of bartering for food, instead of giving gifts and getting food in return, Magellan could now demand that the Cebuanos provision the Spanish king's official Armada del Maluco for the rest of its journey to Indonesia. It could now be demanded of subjects. So this was really a turning point. In fact, it was, think about it. It's like tribute in reverse. Remember, Humabu said, okay, no more tribute. We won't, we won't demand that you give us tribute. Instead, we'll give each other gifts. There's no demand. But in this case, there was demand. So here was Magellan demanding. Demanding that Humabon and his chiefs give them food. You know, this story of the visit of, of Magellan, there's a lot that one can speculate on. You sort of wonder if Humabon and his chiefs thought that they could just go along with the foreigners, you know, say, oh, so yeah, let's just keep the peace. Let's give them food and then maybe they'll just go away. Maybe Humabon said, you know, let's just work through some kind of an alliance and uh, these foreigners have got better weapons. Maybe it's better. We just kind of keep them quiet. But once Magellan started burning villages that would not give him food, uh, that was another story. The warrior side of Magellan was being revealed. Not all the chiefs in Cebu and Mactan were loyal to Humabon. There was a chief on Mactan by the name of Zula, and he was, he was uh, loyal to Humabon. He had some kind of an alliance with him. But Chief Lapulapu, he was independent. Lapulapu's village, if you look at the map of Cebu and Mactan, you'll see that Lapulapu's village was along a strait of water common to Cebu and Mactan Islands. And today that waterway is called Mactan Channel or Opon Channel. Opon is at the end, one entrance to the channel. And it is claimed that that was very close to where Lapu-Lapu lived. And Lapu-Lapu would even raid vessels that were near Opon, heading into the channel, heading for Cebu. So we, we don't know if this is really true, but it seems that Lapu-Lapu was in direct competition with Humabon for control of the strait. Now, Pigafetta wrote that after midnight, so remember the um, uh, chief Zula says, I can only give you, Magellan, I can only give you two goats because I've got a problem. There's this other leader on Mactan, he doesn't want to give food to you. So why don't you send me some people to help me um, to help me out with uh, this lapu-lapu and then we'll get more food for you. The next day, before, before af right after midnight, the next day, right after midnight, Magellan set out with 60 men on, on smaller, smaller boats. And they wore that metal helmet. Now you see it in the picture. It's called the Marion. And by the way, that's why we have the Mariones Festival. The Mariones Festival is named after the helmet that the Spanish soldiers wore. So I was wondering how heavy, you know, how heavy was the Marion? And there it says it's about, um, I still think in pounds. No? So it's about 2.9 pounds. And I was looking at the current ballistic helmets, which are clearly much lighter. But I found out that if you add the camera and the night vision lights, and uh, um, they even have these things like 
for the ears, to cover the ears. By the time you add it to that basic ballistic metal, it also weighs about the same as a metal morion. I, I couldn't get the weight of the corslet, but it seems like it's, it's, it has weight, but it may not be really that heavy, no? Anyway, they wore that morion and they wore the chest armor called a corslet. It seems like they left the heavier uh, armor on board their ships, the, on board their ships. Now, Magellan um, had 11 of his 60 men stay aboard small boats and uh, to watch the boats as uh, Magellan went down with 49 of his Armada crew. And that's what they carried. They had, um, they had that arquebus and they had crossbows. And, you know, those, it's very interesting. I think you might enjoy Googling. What is an arquebus? How do you use it? What is a crossbow? How do you use it? Because we keep saying these were superior arms. They were superior arms, but they were useful when you were on land, if you were on steady on a steady boat, or if you were on land. But if you were marching, it wasn't that easy. No? If you were marching, it wasn't that easy to reload the arrows or uh, were, or reload the uh, archibos. Take a look at it. No? So anyway, uh, what happened was the Spanish found themselves wading in water. And they, they just really could not reload. They, their, their, um, um, their weapons weren't really doing much to, um, to kill any of, of Lapu-Lapu's uh, men. And to make Matters worse, uh, Lapu-Lapu said, burn the houses of the natives. And all the more this infuriated, all the more this infuriated uh, the natives. They claim that it is, was 1,500 fighters on shore versus the 50 Spanish. But anyway, let's see, look at that. That's how, probably how it looked, except they were in water. That, that just shows you how they dressed. Next, next slide. Clearly, Magellan thought that his arquebuses, his um, crossbows, and then he thought that the, uh, whatever arm, whatever munitions he had, that they would really be able to put Lapu-Lapu in his place. Kumabon underrated what the native artillery could do. Kumabon was instructed to more, a, in the meantime, you probably say, well, there's Magellan with his 49 people and they're firing at 1,500 men of Lapu-Lapu. So what happened to his ally, uh, Raja Kumabon? Well, Magellan had told Humabon to stay a good distance away from the shore, a good distance away from Magellan and his fighters, because he said, look, Humabon, we are the soldiers of the most, uh, the, the strongest, the most important king in the whole world. You just watch how we fight. We're going to show you how we fight. So he, Magellan really underrated what the what the natives could do. And Pigafetta mentions that, uh, but Pigafetta mentions that there were four Christianized natives who died with the Spanish. So we kind of wonder if maybe Umabon did send a few people to, to try to help in the end when he saw what was happening. But on this 20th day of Magellan in Cebu, it was a massacre, absolute massacre. See, Magellan was fighting a seasoned warrior. 
they say that Lapu-Lapu may have already been in his 60s, or close to being a senior citizen, no longer a young man. But clearly, if at, you know, at that age, there's a lot you know about strategy. You can train your warriors to fight. So I think his men were very well prepared, in if, even if they only had a few hours of warning. We need to understand that during the time of Lapu-Lapu, please read this slide, because there was no notion of nation state yet. Lapu-Lapu was fighting to maintain the freedom of his barangay and possibly its allies. Perhaps he was avenging the burning of the villages. Perhaps he was protecting the island's food supply of the food that is eaten every day. You know, Magellan arrived during Tag Init. He arrived in March. So there was a new crop of rice, a new crop of, of millet. But there was no telling what would happen between March and the next harvest. So many things could go wrong. The rice crop could fail, which, you know, there could have been uh, no rain or too much rain. There could have been storms. The rice crop could be, have been attacked by locusts. The rice crop could have been attacked by giant worms that eat the roots of the rice plant. So it was not easy before to, to store food. So maybe Lapu-Lapu was thinking, no, this, this food business is getting out of hand. And what else is significant? The food that Lapu-Lapu was taking was not just ordinary, everyday food. Cebuanos were domesticating chickens and pigs. The animals that they were domesticating were used in rituals. They're considered prestige foods. And you need to conduct these rituals to assure abundant rice harvest, to assure good fishing, to assure a happy wedding, to assure the delivery of a baby. You needed to have prestige foods because this was what the gods wanted, the pagan gods wanted. And if you didn't have these prestige foods, you could not satisfy the requirements of the ritual. So, here was Magellan taking away everyday food and even taking away the ritual food that was needed if one was going to perform a prayer to the gods asking for good health for one who was ill. So you see, there's a lot to... Uh, to the food story of the Battle of Mactan. Now, what is little known, usually left out of the story, is that on the day that the survivors of uh, Magellan's crew were going to leave Cebu, Humabon invited them for a meal during which he said he was going to give the gold jewelry for Charles V, Charles V. And the officers who had taken the place of Magellan said that they would attend and that they would ask Humabon for guides who could bring them to the Malukas. Pigafetta didn't go because he got hit on the face by a poison arrow and his face was swelling. Uh, there maybe were 35 people all in all who had died. Uh, by the way, oh, so anyway, uh, he, his face was swollen, and they say that at the meal, there were about 35 people who went, and all of them were killed during the meal. But um, we don't know for sure. But the point here is that 
Kumabon also was avenging, of possibly avenging. Uh, we're not sure because the evidence is inconclusive. So we can see that food is a means of deception as well. And we don't know if Humabon hosted that May 1st uh, massacre of a meal uh, because some say he made peace with Lapu-Lapu and the other chiefs. And so he needed to get back at the Spanish for his own protection and safety. Others say that maybe he hosted the meal, the banquet, so that they could kill off all the Spanish because they were also worried that the Spanish might try to retaliate for Magellan's death. No one, no one knows for sure. And that I think gives you some idea of another dimension of the death of Magellan, another dimension to, to why there was the battle in Mactan. Now let's get on to the third part. And this is the last part of the food story. It's a very short episode. And hunger, despite their loading up food in, in Cebu, hunger continued to follow the armada wherever they went in Philippine waters. There were about 180 men who sailed from Cebu, but there weren't enough of them to command the three ships, to sail the three ships. So they burned the Concepcion and decided that they would just keep two boats, the Trinidad and the Victoria that you saw earlier in the picture. You have to understand that in 1521, there was no canning. There was no refrigeration that hadn't been invented yet. So the food that was loaded in Spain, it was state-of-the-art food. Huh? It was state-of-the-art naval rations for the era. They had salted and dried meat and fish. So that's like our tapa. They had tapa. And then they had dried fish. You know? They had um, biscuits that were baked very, very hard so that there was no more, mo no more moisture in them. And that was hoped to make them last longer. They carried dried beans, they carried chickpeas, and they carried some uh, raw rice also. You see there on the screen a page from the original list of food that was carried on the ships when they left Spain. Imagine you're looking at a piece of paper that is 500 years old and it's still around. It's being cared for by the archivos, the Indias in Seville, where there are many, many documents about the Philippines and about Asia. And um, you will, I don't know if you can see it, but it shows that the ships also carry garlic and honey. It wasn't easy for the ships to find the Malucos, uh, the Spice Islands. They kept getting lost. They still had no guide, remember. And when they were unable to barter for food, they raided the boats that they saw. You know, They said, okay, maybe that boat has food. We'll steal their food. And uh, so they would take the food. Sometimes they would just kidnap people on, you know, there's a boat. They kidnap the people on board the boat. And they say, where are you from? Take us to your, take us to your island. And then they show these kidnapped people. And they say, okay, if you want these people back, give us food. But it, it already became like that. They were almost like pirates. They were desperate for food. And when they got finally got to the Spice Islands, when they finally got there, uh, that was where they had their food. Because the leader of Tidor, which is one of the Spice Islands, fed them. He, understand, he understood. And his name was Raja Sultan Mansur. 
just so you get an idea of what happened to the remaining crew that survived the Battle of Manktan, it wasn't, um, remember they were here in the Philippines in March, so it um, wasn't until December of that year when they finally were able to set sail for their homeland. And Raja Sultan Mansur made sure that the two ships had enough clothes to trade, make them millionaires, in fact, you want to look at it that way, millionaires. Um, there was food, there was water, there was firewood for the journey back. Now, the Armada's men, they knew what it was like to cross the Pacific. They had survived hunger for three months. But again, they had no idea how long it was going to take them to get from the Spice Islands to Spain. And it took them nine months, three times the length of their trip across the Pacific. It took them nine months to get from the Spice Islands to Spain. And once again, they suffered extreme hunger. What happened, by the way, I don't know if it's clear there, but what happened was when they were in Tidor and they were supposed to leave, so there were two boats. One boat suddenly had a very bad leak. So that boat stayed in Tidor. It was going to be fixed, and it was going to attempt to try to sail back via South America. But the little, the small, the smaller ship, the one uh, you saw a picture of, the Victoria, that was the one that did the circumnavigation. It was the one who crossed uh, from, from the Spice Islands via Africa, staying away from the Portuguese, because remember, they were not supposed to go into Portuguese waters. But anyway, so that was the boat that made it home. And uh, let's see, and with them, there were only 18 men, imagine, only 18 men of 235 sailors who had left Spain. So you can imagine, this is, this is really something for a novel. Uh, this is really a voyage of discovery and survival. And it was one Sebastian Elcano from the Basque area who took over the, uh, he was the skipper of the boat. And when he returned home, he was given many honors, including a coat of arms. You can see it at the bottom. And the coat of arms has, uh, it's got two pieces of cinnamon crossed, and then it has nutmeg and uh, cloth. Now, Elcano was considered a hero. Indeed, what Magellan started and Elcano finished was historic for the world. The ability to travel to new realms has inspired many changes in how humanity thinks, in how humanity deals person to person, in how humanity relates country to country. So we have to realize that discovery can be good. In 1521, the seed of human rights, there was no term human rights in 1521. That is a modern term, human rights. There's no such idea in 1521. But the seed of human rights was being planted. And it was being planted by a friar, being planted by a priest by the name of Bartolome de las Casas. The king invited Father de las Casas to talk about the problems of what was happening in Mexico. And, and Father de las Casas said, you know, we Spanish, we live there in Mexico, we are abusing those poor natives. We are treating them so badly. We are not treating them like honorable Spanish. And we are not treating those 
those uh, Indians in Mexico like Christians. And so De Las Casas became known as protector of the Indians. And over centuries, colonial powers would rise and they would fall. They would have their abuses and they would have their good points. And people would instead create republics and the idea that Stakeholders have rights and responsibilities to sustain a better world. Stakeholders have the right to give their opinion, not just leaders, but stakeholders. So the circumnavigation that we are commemorating this year is a significant discovery. It's not, it is as important today as, let's say, the first astronauts landing on Jupiter to see if humans can live there. It's that big a deal. It's that big a discovery. This year, we are not celebrating conquest. No. What we are celebrating is the power of discovery. Discovering places, discovering differences, how to deal with differences, discovering new ideas. I'd like to end this morning with what the world can discover about Filipinos by studying our food history, I guess by discovering our hospitality. Next slide. Hospitality and food go hand in hand. By studying how over many centuries, we Filipinos feed and care for other people. We remind ourselves of traits that we may want to continue as a living part of our, of our Filipino heritage. It's because food history is not, it's not only about recipes and cooking grandmother's dishes and how a food began. Food history is also the story of, this, of the circumnavigation, the book of Pigafetta, the first written evidence about Filipino foods. We know that the Battle of Mactan, we now know that it has a food story, the need for food security, and the value of food in ancient religious rituals. You know, while studying our food history and not just the Battle of Mactan, I look into old dictionaries. These are dictionaries that were made during the Spanish era. Um, there's an unpublished one of 1609, and I have, I have looked into that one as well. So that's how far back I, I study our food. And when I look at these old dictionaries, they document ingredients, they document cooking procedures, Sometimes they even give the names and descriptions of foods. And they tell us about what is food to the Filipino. Among the most important words I found is from Cebu. So we've been talking about Cebu, the Battle of Mactan. Well, it is from Bisaya that I found a wonderful word. It's there on the screen. Naya, naya. That is a very important word. It, it's a good word. It says good things about being Filipino. Nayanaya has two meanings. And you see it says to entertain, be food, serve guests, and be a happy person. If you put the two meanings together, we realize that the Filipinos have a wonderful tradition. We love to feed others as much as we love eat. And this means that by feeding others, we make their tummies happy. And at the same time, we become happy because we're doing a good deal using food. So this is a lesson from food history. It's not only that the Battle of Mactan was in defense of keeping food for the people there, but it's also something good about who we are. So I hope that this talk has reminded us of what's good about being Filipino, 
what a wonderful Filipino trait to sustain Naya Naya is, and let us continue to use food to bring happiness. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you very much, uh, Mom Feliz Santa Maria, for that uh, comprehensive and wonderful lecture about food history and especially the relation of food in the Battle of Mactan and in the celebration of the first circumnavigation of the world. But before we continue with the question and answer portion, uh, we would like to thank our partner agencies Paul, for this uh, Canton 2 500 online lecture series, Paul. Uh, Presidential Communications Office, Operations Office or PCOO, the Department of Foreign Affairs or DFA, uh, Department of Education, RTVM, and of course the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. And now, uh, let's get po our viewers na nanonood po sa iba't ibang pages oh. po ng uh, ating partner agencies. So from NQC po, binabati po namin si Ma'am Lorna Gonzaga. Good morning po. Sir Leonard Christopher Eduarte from uh, one, uh, Museo ni Juan and Antonio Luna in Ilocos Norte. Wow! Uh, hi, That's Sir awesome. Alvin Ignao. And Mr. Uh, Agosto L. Malonso. Uh, a beautiful, informative food history. Mabuhay po kayo from sabi po niya. Salamat. From DepEd po. Uh, Dito po ma'am, actually marami po tayong mga viewers na teachers na nanonood po talaga kapag nag-online uh, live streaming po tayo. Ito po from uh, Ma'am Rudalyn Gomez Carido. Good morning, watching from New Canaan Integrated School, uh, Alabel, First, Di- uh, First District Division of Sarangani. Oh nice! Uh, Ma'am Gumangang sila dyan! <laughs> Mang Felipa Banilla Maghopoy. So, good morning from Bayugan. Uh, thanks sa lahat and God bless po from Marie Celestra Salazar. Sobrang dami pa po namin, uh, nating viewers from Dep. At hindi na po natin masasama sila. No? Well, anyways, maraming maraming salamat po. Dito naman po from DFA. Uh, thank you po. It's very informative to our community. From Toledo City Library. Uh, hello, uh, from Osaka, uh, si Ma'am Elizabeth Omega Aboshi. And uh, from Singapore po, nanonood po si Ma'am Maria Cristina Saiko Mendoza. And dito naman po sa NCCA, let's check. <laughs> so, uh, from Timothy Sanchez po, uh, he has a comment po. Figafeta's account also confirmed that the natives are not savages. Yes. Yes. Definitely, we were not savages. And ito po, uh, from Miss, uh, Mr. Eugene Escalderon. Good morning, watching from Kalabangan National High School, special program in the arts. And dito naman po, pasok po tayo sa ating Zoom. Yan. Uh, from Mr. Franlex Valencia, good morning po. Mas hugid na tagusubaybay mula sa San Jose del Monte, Bulacan. And ito naman po, uh, bumabati din po from DPWH. So, maraming maraming salamat po. Uh, from Maria Rodora, Agustinian po, uh, from PUP po. As always po, Mang Feliz, nabusog po ang tami at nabusog ang puso as we are inspired by the thoughts about food and history. Maraming salamat po from Proud PUP faculty, the Sintang Paralan of your late uh, father, Dr. Nemesio Prudente. Oh, uh, tate niyo po pala si, um, yes. si Dr. Prudente. <laughs> Ayan, so again, maraming maraming salamat po. And now, dumako, po, dumako na po tayo sa question and answer portion. So, Jer Will, uh, ano-ano ba yung mga nakalatag na questions natin dyan? Ano From mga tanong? Ma'am, from our attendee here in Zoom webinar, si Miss Nina Rasela. Yes. Ang question po niya is, how similar was the pork bloods to act then to the dinuguan we have now? Ah, 
wala po wala pong binanggit si Pigafetta o yung ibang survivors ng circumnavigation na pinakain po sila ng parang tinuguan. Wala po yan. Wala. Ayoko mag-comment kasi talagang wala. Hindi nakalagay. Pwede tayo mag-usap tungkol sa dinuguan pero ibang usapan po yan. <laughs> Hindi siya sa circumnavigation po. Baka magkalituhan tayo. <laughs> Magaling tayo to use the whole animal, no? whether it's uh, a fish, a chicken, a pork, no, uh, carabao, cow, walang walang nasasayang, no. So that's let's just put it also that way, walang nasasayang. Okay, po. Thank you, uh, Ma'am Felice, for answering that question. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Oh, from Lenny Isrobel. How would this story be told from a decolonial perspective? From a decolonial perspective. Decolonial perspective. I, I I don't quite. What do you mean? Ah, uh, uh, decolonial po. Ah, uh, well. I think we've tried to explain that the Battle of Mactan is not only the story of perhaps power struggles between um, native, between islander uh, political uh, political leaders. It, it's not only a story of that. There, there's also a bit of the hum human story here protecting the food supply. So if we take out the whole idea of, of politics, let, let's take out the politics, if that's what you mean, and let's just talk about this from a, a regular person's point of view. Would you like it if somebody was gonna, was gonna force you to give part of your hard-earned food and just take it? I mean, it's different when you give food voluntarily and another thing when somebody takes it from you and says if you don't give me the food I'm gonna burn your house down that's what this story is about I mean it may be maybe if Magellan hadn't he was only there what 20 days he was already dead you know so maybe between around day 14 and day 20 he starts going around trying to get this his provisions, and he starts burning villages. So take out the politics. Do you want people to go around burning your villages and taking your food supply? I think that that's part of the question. So even if, let's say, sabi ni humaban, o sige, sige, sige na lang tayo, let's try to please these people. But once they start burning villages and taking away food, Next year, your own people are going to starve. Iba na eh. the, the equation changes. I think if you start taking away people's food by force, even the leadership now starts beginning to wonder. That, that's my, I don't know if I answered the question correctly, but I'm speaking as a Filipino. I'm not speaking as a Spaniard. I'm not speaking uh, as uh, as uh, politics. I'm just saying, you start to burn my house and steal my food, no way. And you're going to do the same to my neighbor? I am not going to let you steal my neighbor's food. I'm going to help my neighbor protect his or her food supply. That's my story. Okay po, Ma'am Felice, thank you for answering again that question. I think wala na pong matanong. So again... Kain na! Kumain yes, na! Kain na! Kain na! Sakto po, maglalunch. Kain na kayo. <laughs> again po, uh, maraming maraming salamat po, uh, Ma'am Felice, uh, for sharing your lecture and to our viewers uh, na walang sawang sumusuporta sa ating mga on, uh, webinars. Since... Uh, 
2019 at uh, since last year I mean since 2020 so thank you very much and uh nais ko lang pong uh, magbigay ng take away lesson from uh Ma'am Phyllis lecture no nakita natin na ang uh, kung gaano po kahalag naging kahalaga yung role ng pagkain sa ating kasi science especially the history of the first circumnavigation of the world uh especially the Philippine part uh Nakita natin na yung pagkain ginamit uh, naging uh, malag- mahalaga kasangkapan din para ipakita ng ating mga sinuunang ninuno ang pagiging uh, mabait, pagpapakita ng pakikipagkapwa tao nang nakita nilang uh, nagugutom uh, under Nordish ang mga uh, crew ni Magellan nung uh, lumapag sila sa may Pomonhon no. Uh, noong March 18, 1521. Bukod dito, nakita din natin na nagamit din ng pagkain upang uh, mag-establish ng, uh, ng, pakik- ng peace sa isang community. Hindi lang, uh, hindi lang sila gumagamit ng blood compact. No? So, ginamit din ng pagkain para uh, makipagkaibigan, makikapagkapwa-tao. Uh, Second, uh, at third, Uh, ginamit din ng pagkain para alam niyo na uh, ma, ma um, uh, during the massacre in Cebu no, na upang paghigantihan yung mga napatay na ancestors natin ginamit din ng pagkain and lastly nakita din natin na magandang pag-aralan ng food history kasi marami tayong natututunan dito bukod sa ipapakita yung kultura natin in other side of our values mas napapaiting pa natin ang kahalagahan ng ating uh, heritage. So aside from political history, cultural history, so yung mga historians or uh, enthusiasts dyan, pwede nating pag-aralan ng food history. So yun lamang po, maraming maraming salamat po. Uh, Ms. Jerry, meron ka pa bang i-add? Or pahabol na announcements? Ayan, before we end this live streaming, ito ang ilan sa mga major activities ng NQC na dapat niyong antabayanan. So, una dyan is yung unveiling of the Samar, Homonhon, and Suluan Quincentennial Markers na magaganap sa March 16, 2021 sa Gister, sa Giwan Eastern Samar. So, ito ay in line with the 500th anniversary of the Philippine part of the first circumnavigation of the world. Another one is yung declaration of the Basilica Minore of the Santo Niño de Cebu and image of the Santo Niño de Cebu as national cultural treasure in line with the 500th anniversary of Christianity in the Philippines on, October, on April 14, 2021. Kasabay nito ay magkakaroon din ng opening ng Santo Niño Traveling Exhibit in partnership with Agustinian Province of Santo Niño de Cebu and Cebu City Cultural and Historical Affairs Office. So, opening din po ito ng Philippine Quincentennial Museum sa Museo Cebu in partnership with the Provincial Government of Cebu. At dapat din abangan sa April 27 or D-Day na Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines, ang 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan na gaganap din sa Lapu-Lapu City at opening ng Manila Metropolitan Theater kung saan gaganapin ang evening gala show ng Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines na pangungunahan ng National Commission for Culture and the Arts, National Historical Commission of the Philippines at National Quincentennial Committee. At upang mag updated sa mga nakaline up na programa para sa 2021 QCP, ang tabayanan lamang ang NQC Facebook page at kita-kit sa mga susunod pang countdown to 500 online lecture series. Muli, maraming salamat po sa inyo lahat at mabuhay po kayo. Thank you po sa lahat.